Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders, and it's that time of the week. It's lecture time. This week, I throw you guys a massive curveball, guys, and that curveball is personal finance, wealth building, investing, and just overall how to grow your net worth. I know every week I usually talk about something technically related to trading, charts, candlesticks, money management, psychology, et cetera, and so forth. But I've been getting so many requests about wealth building, especially in this time when a lot of people are hurting for money because they didn't prepare properly for a big bad event. See, here's the thing, guys. It's not if it's going to rain. It's not if there's going to be a hurricane. It's when there's going to be a hurricane. And there's a lot of people out there playing the victim role. Well, I don't make enough money or, you know, there's not a high enough paying job for this or this or that. So I'm going to talk about all of those things as well as how you can build your net, your net worth, guys. How do you build your wealth? How do you retire with actual money, not 50 or $100,000, because as you're going to see in the presentation, it's sad. The average American in their 60s, in their 60s, retires with $172,000. You got to live 30 more years on $172,000 plus Social Security. Guys, Social Security, the average recipient in America, $1,461 a month. $1,460. You can't even live in a tent in San Francisco for $1,400 a month, okay? They won't even let you live on the streets for $1,400 a month. My point is, most Americans and probably other folks around the world are completely, utterly, and grossly unprepared for retirement. So we talk a lot about trading, which is an income producing activity, but I wanna take that income production from trading and turn it into wealth and growing your net worth, and yes, it's simple, but it's going to take some discipline, all right? And a lot of that is staying out of debt and making good financial decisions, which many, many people are not good at. So this week, like I said, we took a little bit of a curve, all right? Normally we talk specifics about trading, but I wanted to do a wealth management, a wealth management lecture this week because I think it's very, very important. Uh, and to be honest, this is about 30 pages out of a larger course that I'm developing. I'm developing a 250 page all day wealth um, wealth management personal finance course here at Live Traders, and this is just a snippet. So it's kind of like a sneak peek inside, like a preview to a movie, so to speak, but there's a lot of good information. I go for over an hour on about 30 to 35 slides. You don't want to miss it, guys. Also, I know this is going to be obsolete um, by the time some of you are watching this a week from now, a month from now, but next week, next Wednesday, one week from today, we're having an open house April 29th or April 30th, whatever next Wednesday is, guys, we're having a Live Traders open house in the chat room. The link is in the description. It is free, free, free for the day to stop by. Like I said, if you're watching this a month from now, it doesn't matter. It's April 30th, something like that, 2020. So if you're watching it in May, you missed it. All right. So again, guys, this lecture is on wealth building, personal finance, investing, and how to grow your net worth. I hope you guys enjoy it. And as always, if you don't join the open house, you can still get a $1 14-day trial to the Live Traders chat room. If you like this video, please click, 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 click the like button. And I would also appreciate it if you liked it, subscribe to it, smash that button, hit that button, crush that button. Why not? A lot of great material, all right? I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. Today's lecture, guys, is on personal finance and wealth building, how to retire rich. Now, I did a shorter version of this at mentorship. Um, this is a much, uh, I should say, let me rephrase that. I did a longer, a longer version of this at mentorship. Um, I can't count in the last six months how many times people have asked me to do some type of personal finance, wealth building, long-term stock um, presentation, lecture, et cetera, and so forth. So I thought now would be a good time to do it considering uh, some of the things I've been seeing out there with the coronavirus, with regard to people's savings rates, uh, with regard to the people or the lack of people invested in the market, et cetera, and so forth. I thought this would be a good time. But also, okay, also, this is a prelude to something bigger. 
And let me explain before I really dig deep into this. Um, I'm going to be doing a personal finance and wealth building course at Live Traders. It'll be a paid for course. It's going to be about 200 pages, um, probably six to eight hours. Um, this is just a teaser for that. All right. This is about 25 slides. That's going to be about 200. OK. In fact, last night when I was putting some of this together, um, I, I was so tempted. I had about 70 slides in here. And I'm like, no, nah, I can't, can't give away that much of the course. Um, so nonetheless, uh, this is a prelude to that. But I've gotten uh, a ton of requests for this. So hopefully, you know, you guys will enjoy it. And hopefully you guys will actually watch it. Because the last time I did something that you guys requested, trader tax accounting, nobody watched it. All right. So here's the thing. Every week, every week, lately, I start with this, right? When will the insanity stop? When will it stop? And what normally we do on the next slide is take a look at stupidity. Stupidity meaning bad trading. Somebody blowing up an account or losing 10 grand, losing 50 grand, losing 100 grand, etc. and so forth. This time I am talking about the average American's financial well-being. That's what I'm saying this week when I talk about when will the insanity stop. So we're going to take a quick look at the average American's financial well-being. OK, but before we do that, I want to talk to you guys for a second because we saw it twice in the chat room today, twice in the chat room today where traders went to short a stock that was already crazy extended, super extended. So let me explain real quick. OK, give that one second. All right. The average person cursed Wall Street, the stock market, okay, and vowed to never invest in the markets again, all right? I mean, I don't know if you guys remember this, but 08, 09, the average person hated Wall Street. Oh, those bastards, those greedy bastards on Wall Street needing bailouts, blah, 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 this, I'm never going to invest in the market, screw that, you know, blah, 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 right? Then what happened? What happened? They all cursing Wall Street in the late 08, early 09. And then for the next 11 years, up until about two months ago, the market went on one of the most historic bullish runs in stock market history. In terms of how long it was, it was the longest. In terms of the percentage, I think it was second or third highest percentage return in the history of the market. What am I getting at? You guys are all doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. You're behind the trend. You're backwards. Okay. So I'm going to tie this back in. We're going to look at this again. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it now, but we're going to come back full circle to this in about 30 or 40 minutes from now. Okay. The average person needs to wake the F up, wake up, grow up, man up, girl up, it up, whatever you want to call it, wake up. Okay. Look, you are not broke because of anybody else in this world but you. And I'm going to talk about that at the end. I'm going to repeat it so it sinks the you know what in. You are not broke because of anybody in the world but you. Donald Trump didn't make you broke. Obama didn't make you broke. Nancy Pelosi didn't make you broke. Your boss didn't make you broke. Society didn't make you broke. The man didn't make you broke. You're broke because you're foolish with money. Okay, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. All right. So now, how about this? How much millennials, Gen Xers, and baby boomers have saved for retirement? I think that encompasses most of the people listening and watching, right? For the most part, because that age range is basically from 18 to about 70 years old, give or take. And don't get me wrong. There are probably people outside of that bracket. All right. But take a look at this for a second. 42.2% of millennials have no retirement savings. This orange area means 0% savings. 42. Now, some of this could be forgiven because they're 18 year olds, 20 year olds, 22 years. I get it. Okay. But it's still a high number. We move to Gen Xers. It's 29. It's almost 30%. How in the world can you be 35 years old and don't have a single dollar saved for retirement? 30% of you, and I'm a Gen Xer, okay? I'm 42, I'm a smack in the middle of Gen X, all right? How in the world can you be in that position? Baby boomers and seniors, 28%, and this is more egregious than the Gen Xers because it's almost the same number. 
right? 30% and 28% is pretty damn close. And if you're 55 or older and you don't have a penny saved for retirement, I don't know what to, I don't even know what to say. All right. Now I'm going to go through some of these slides quicker. 30% of millennials have less than 10 grand saved. 22% of Gen Xers less than 10 grand saved. The point I'm making is, is I would consider $300,000 or more where you need to be. And 300,000, let's be honest, is not that much money. And look at the percentages. Only 22% of people over 55 years old have $300,000 saved for retirement. Okay. This includes all retirement savings, IRAs, 401ks, stock market investments, not including the, the, uh, the value of your home. Okay. Are you kidding me? 4.9 millennials, 12.1. The people who should be most disgraced here is, is the baby boomers. 22.4%. Now, why am I commenting on this? Because I'm going to come back to this full circle later too. Guess who taught the Gen Xers and millennials personal finance? The baby boomers, okay? The baby boomers. They're the ones who are supposed to teach us how to invest our money properly, right? Good financial, personal finance um, methods, right? Strategies, whatever you want to call it. They can't even do it for themselves how do they expect to teach somebody else? Now, the reason I'm commenting, guys, and I'm specifically talking to a lot of Americans because I'm an American, I live here. Foreigners, I know Japanese, for example, have a way better savings rate than Americans. My point I'm making is personal finance is not taught in schools, it's not taught in universities, and it's damn near almost never taught at home. So if nobody's teaching it, how are you gonna get out of the rat race and the rut? You're basically taught to be poor. I'm not joking. You are taught to be poor. Heck, the government teaches you how to stay on welfare. They literally, oh no, you can't have a car worth more than $3,000. If you do, then you can't get this benefit. Are you kidding me? That's terrible. But the problem we have is an education problem. So I'm hoping to enlighten you guys a little bit today about this so that you can get your own personal finances in order and maybe help your kids or family or friends do the same thing, okay? Because this is a disgrace. I mean, it's, you think COVID-19 is bad? This is a far bigger problem than that because this affects all 330 million Americans, okay? That, not so much, okay? So let's just, I'm gonna go through some of these slides quicker than others because I won't get through all of them if I don't. All right, now, in your 40s, I skipped millennials, or uh, yeah, millennials here. In your 40s, one in 10 are very confident they'll be able to retire comfortable in their lifestyle, 10%. 63,000 is the average amount of money people in their 40s, the median amount, the middle ground, the median amount of money that people in their 40s have saved for retirement. Pathetic. Let's move on. I'm going through some of these quick, okay? People in their 50s, the average amount, the median amount is $117,000 in your 50s. Think about this. You are roughly, roughly 10 years away from retirement, roughly, and you got 117 grand saved? Wow. 59% expect or plan to work past the age of 65 or plan to never retire. Almost 60%. That's insane. Let's keep going. I'm going to go through this quick, okay? In your 60s, which is the retirement decade for most people, from 60 to 70, that is when the vast majority of people retire, right? 82% either plan to or are already working past 65. 82%. Four-fifths of people in their 60s plan to work past the age of 65. Guys, 82%. One more time. Say it together with me. 82% are working past 65 years old. It's a disgrace. And I guarantee you, not all of them are choosing to do it there. They have to do it. Okay? Okay. $172,000 is the median savings, and 47%, we're going to get to this in the next slide, 47% of people expect Social Security to be their primary source of income when they retire. That means their main source, their number one source of income in retirement. So nearly half of people in their 60s are relying almost entirely on Social Security as their main source of income. Wait, let's find out what that looks like. Hello. 2019. 
the average Social Security monthly benefit, the average monthly Social Security benefit was $1,461. 47% of 60 to 65, 70-year-olds are relying almost entirely on $1,461 to live off of in retirement. I'm, I'm, I'm being quiet for a second because I want that to sink in for a second. Almost 50% of 60-year-olds, this is their main source of income, which means their secondary source of income is less than $1,461. That won't even buy you a tent in San Francisco. You won't even let you live on the street for $1,400 in San Francisco. You get my point here. How are you doing this? So if we don't have a wake-up call, how are you going to get out of this rut, this problem, okay? So here's just a basic overview from Transamerica Center for Retirement Studies. 20s, 16 grand saved. 30s, 45, 40s, 63. You can see the numbers. And yet, what is the recommended or suggested salary you're going to need? At least 8 to 10 times your annual salary. Well, if you divide 172 by 10, it's 17 grand. Well, I would imagine that most people out there in their 40s, 50s, and 60s are making more than $17,000 a year. But they only have 170 grand saved in their 60s, and they're going to likely live 30 more years. 30 more years. Divide 172 by 30. You're going to live on $6,000 a year? What if you take 5% interest on that? You invest it in the market and take 5% of that. Wow, 5%, that's $8,000 a year. That plus Social Security, you're on $2,000. $2,000 a month. Where are you living for two grand? With your kids. With your kids. I'm not saying it can't be done. It's just very uncomfortable if you have to do that. I hope this is a wake-up call. Now, one quick comment, and I'm going to move on. Quick. It's just quick. Fantasy versus reality. 34% of millennials, 30, one-third of millennials, think they need less than $200,000 to retire comfortably. Read that again. 34% of millennials think, and remember, millennials are 18 to 34 years old, young people. So we all know 30 or 40 years from now, inflation is going to eat away at your money. They think they need 200000 or less to retire. One third of you millennials out there. Head out of sand. Experts suggest you're going to need $1.1, $1.2 million. Experts suggest you're going to need close to $1.2 million for a 30-year retirement. But hey, let's go back. Most people have 172000 as they approach retirement. 172000 and you're going to need $1 million plus. Hmm, interesting stuff, okay? Now, let's move on. This is I'm showing you the negative. We'll talk about how you can fix it later. How much money do you have saved in your savings account? Guys, 58% of people have $1,000. 58% of Americans... Overall, this is not millennials, this is not Gen Xers, this is everybody have less than $1,000 in their savings account. 58% of Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings account. Sad. It's really, really sad. Okay, moving on. All right, moving on. Millennials are split on saving for the long term. 46% of millennials would be scrambling to cover their bills if their next paycheck was withheld. Almost half of millennials couldn't go more than one to two weeks if they didn't get a paycheck. Guys, why am I doing Because I'm showing you everybody. I'm not focusing just on millennials. I'm not focusing just on boomers. I'm not focusing just, I'm showing you tidbits from each category so that you guys can fully appreciate and understand this is not a millennial problem. It's not a boomer problem. It's not a Gen Xer problem. It's an everybody problem, okay? It's an everybody problem. And I bet you it's common in other countries too. It just seems to be really bad in America, okay? 
Wow. This, to me, was one of the scariest slides that I saw, that I had to put in. This is one of the scariest. I call it financially illiterate. I misspelled it, though, so maybe I'm financially illiterate. All right, financially illiterate. Why? Look at these numbers for a second. Where people allocate their money. Now, we already know they don't have a lot of money. Right? We already know they don't have a lot of money because they don't save much. But the first two here are checkings and savings. Okay, 44% of people in this category have their money, their investments in checkings or savings account. 44% of their net worth is in cash, basically. Gen Z, which is really young, 50%, which they probably don't have much money. 47% of millennials, cash. And it starts to get a little better for Gen Xers, 38%. Guys, how in the world do you plan on retiring when 38, 40, 50% of your money is in cash? Guys, what is cash? Cash is called going backwards, period. End of discussion. We'll talk about what the long-term 20, 30, 40-year cash return is. Hint, it's less than 2%. Hint, that's not even inflation. You're going backwards by hoarding cash. You know, the grandma told me to put my money under the mattress syndrome. You're going backwards by using cash. This is disturbing that the vast majority of Z millennials and Xers have their money in cash. Cash is king for certain things, but cash is not king for retirement. Okay? All right, let's move on. Now, we're going to talk about a four-letter word here that's really nasty. It's worse than the F word, okay? It's unequivocally, hands down, way worse than the F word. I can't even look at it. I'm just closing my eyes. I can't even look at it. Debt. Debt. What is debt? Debt is slavery. It's financial slavery that's what debt is and no that is an accurate assessment of this no there's no political correctness that's an accurate assessment debt is when you owe other people if you owe other people you no longer control your money so yes it's slavery somebody else controls you through money okay through money so yes it's financial slavery Okay, guys real quick I gotta hold on one second we're in BYND guys I'm going to raise the stop Okay, on BYND, now that we're at 90% of target to 88.50. So hold on one second. Let me raise this up. Give me a second. We'll get back to the lecture in just a second. All right. Um, 88.50, raise the stop. Okay. Target is 90.50. All right. All right. Back to the business at hand. Okay. I hate stopping in the middle of this important topic. 90% of target, Eric. You get the drill, buddy. Okay. Debt, guys. Guess what? Everybody has it. Almost. The average credit card debt in America is $10,000. $10,000. Now, some of you that make good money, like, well, that's nothing. I could, you know, I could pay that off. Guys, the average household income in America is about $60,000. The average household income, that's parents, both parents working, is 60. And you have 10,000 in 17% credit card debt. Are you nuts? Okay, are you nuts? And this is household net worth versus credit card debt. Look at this, look at this middle bracket here. Your household net worth is say 10 to $100,000 and you have six, six to $7,000 in credit card debt. And I guarantee you the vast majority of this is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20%, right? Yeah, interest rates are at all time lows. Credit card companies don't give a you know what. They're still charging a 17, 18%, aren't they? You might have a good one at 12%, right? Unless you have some type of Wells Fargo, Abbott, Downing Foundation connection, you might be able to get six, 7%. But most credit cards are 15 to 20 these days, whoops. Okay, now, just in case you think this is a 
ethnic problem for white people. No, it's black people. No, it's Asians. No, it's Latinos. No, it's everybody. It's Gen Xers, it's Millennials, it's Gen Zs, it's Baby Boomers, it's Whites, it's Blacks, it's Asians, it's Hispanics. It doesn't matter. You are all in debt. All of you. Look at it. White people have the most, okay? Nationwide average, almost 7,800 there. Look at this across the board. Everybody's got debt. And then you look at the debt by age. It's brutal. And this is just credit card debt. The worst kind of unsecured high interest debt for stupid stuff that most likely you didn't need. Oh, my daughter really wanted to go on that school trip and we just didn't have the $2,000 to send her to our senior trip to Costa Rica. So I just swiped the card. You know, she needed to go on that trip. It's every child's rite of passage to go on their senior trip. Bullshit. If you can't afford it and you got to use plastic, you can't afford it. It's unbelievable the justification that you guys make for doing for being stupid. And we're going to talk about once verse needs soon. Everyone's got debt. Every generation and every race has it. They all do. Okay? It afflicts everybody. Now, what's the problem here? It's a decision. That's the problem. We live in a consumer-based society in America. That's what we do. Right? People are keeping up with the Kardashians. They got to have the latest iPhone or they have to have the new car when they're 25 and it can't be a Honda Civic. It's got to be a BMW to show all their friends because they got a new job. We can go on for hours about that. All right. But debt is a decision about needs versus wants. The problem is too many of you confuse what a need is. Let me repeat that part. Too many of you confuse what a genuine need is versus what a genuine want is. You don't need a new iPhone. You want a new iPhone. You don't need a new BMW or a new car for that matter. You want a new car. You don't need that expensive vacation. You want that expensive vacation, okay? Your kids don't need $100 Nike sneakers. They want $100 Nike sneakers. There's a difference. So generally people, generally speaking, people don't need most of the stuff they have. They want most of the stuff. Expensive cars, big house, clothes, elaborate vacations. Eating out is a killer for most people. It's a killer, all right? Why do we do these things? Status, ego, peer pressure. How many doctors drive Honda Civics? Seriously, for a second. How many doctors do you know drive a Honda Civic? No, I'm not saying they can't afford something better. I'm just making the point. That's peer pressure. That's ego. That's status. That's all three of those things. Do you want to hire a lawyer that drives a, an old jalopy? Oh, they must not be successful. Maybe they're really successful. Maybe they're not. I don't know. But we do these things and we justify them because of status, ego, peer pressure, the need to feel good. Here's a great one. I love this one. I love this one. I work really hard. I don't get anything. The kids get everything. I deserve that. Can you afford it? No, but I deserve it. You know, because putting food on the table for the kids, what you want a cookie, right, Chris Rock? I ain't never been to jail. What you want a cookie? You put food on the table. It's your job, right? I pay the mortgage. I do this and the kids suck me dry. I deserve that new car. You can't afford it though. Deserving it and affording it are two different things. Maybe you do deserve it, but you still can't afford it. You don't buy it. You guys need to shape up your mindset, okay? And understand what you're really doing to yourself because it's going to hurt you dramatically 10, 20, 30 years from now when you really need that $500 payment times 84 months because that's what people are doing now. And don't even tell me about, but GM is doing 0% financing for 84 months, Jared. You still got to pay for the car. You still got to pay 40 grand for that car, Right? Well, what's $500 a month? Because that's the average car loan. What's $500 a month invested at 9% for seven years versus 0% interest on a car, a depreciating asset? Can you even call it an asset? It's depreciating. Do you guys get where I'm going with this? It's a decision. And you're bad at decision making. Now, let's move on to a different segment. Good debt versus bad debt. 
there is some debt that is, quote, acceptable, right? And there's a lot of debt that's unacceptable. So here's a just a basic list. Good debt, modest. Notice it's underlined in red, modest home ownership, modest. Guys, let me ask you a question. And I know you're going to say, Jared, that's not realistic. How dare you make such a statement? It's just not realistic. It's a rhetorical question, so you don't have to answer. How many of you out there have ever in one year, just one year in your life, made more than your home is worth? Think about it. How many of you out there have ever made more in a year than your home is worth? And if you live in a tent, you don't count. Okay, that doesn't count. Very few people. Now, I would admit it's challenging. It is. It's challenging. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's a cool goal to shoot for. That's a good goal to shoot for. Make more in one year than your home is worth. I know a hedge fund manager that makes $3 million a year and he lives in a $300,000 home. There's nothing wrong with this home. It's not the Taj Mahal, but it's not a dump either. How many of you can say that? Granted, he makes a lot of money, but you understand what I'm saying. My point is, is not that you have to make more than your home's worth. That's not what the point was. The point was, is most of you are in homes that are too big for what you make. I know somebody, as a story, as a personal story, I know somebody that makes $162,000 a year. Good job, right? That's decent money. And he lives in a $900,000 home. Standard 20% down. So what do you have? A mortgage about 700, 720? $700,000 mortgage on $160,000 a year. So you're making what? 13, 14 grand a month and your mortgage is probably four grand. <sighs> That's stupid. That's dumb. And yet you guys go, but if the bank said it's okay, it's okay. If the bank said that I can afford it, I can afford it. Wrong. You can't. Okay. So modest home ownership, investment properties, business startup within reason, modest student loans, not a hundred or 200 grand. And wait, and this is key. This is key for a worthwhile major. You know that 50% of college graduates don't get a job in their, the field of their major, the field of their study. Did you know that 50% of college graduates do not have a job in their major, but they have college debt from that major. Why? Bad guidance. Nobody teaches this to kids. You cannot expect a 17-year-old kid to make a decision on the rest of their life about what good and bad debt is and what $100,000, $200,000 in student loan debt will really do to them 10 years from now. As a parent, you should know that, but you can't expect a 17-year-old kid to know that. It's your job to teach them that. It's your job to help them not make that bad decision. Oh yeah, I'm going to be a political science major or I'm going to be a, a history teacher in high school, but I'm going to get $180,000 in student debt to do it. Good luck with that when you're making 50 grand a year. Okay? Credit cards, bad debt. Car loans, leases, bad debt. Oversized mortgages, bad debt. Extreme student loans and worthless majors, bad debt. Leasing your $1,000 iPhone. I love this. You could just lease your phone. <laughs> it's $1,000, man. Ah, oh, over leveraged rental properties. I'm going to get to this in a minute. Okay, I'm going to get to this in a minute. Come on, BYND, you can do it. We need another like 15, 20 cents. All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, BYND, guys, let's, uh, let's get that stop up. Again, we're getting there. 89.50. Sorry, I got to stop in the middle of this to do this, but... 89.50 guys, there it is. For those of you wondering why I'm not making much money, it's because I lost 600 on the first trade. So I'm really up about 800 bucks right now. Okay, just FYI, this is the 84% rule play. We took BYND on an 84% rule play. Okay, just FYI. Okay, back to business. All right, so that's good and bad debt, all right? Now I want to talk about something else. After we talk about debt and move away from this, we're going, to, we're going to talk about cash flow. But here's the thing, guys. I don't think that I need to, to belabor the point anymore. I spent 20 minutes belaboring. Stay out of debt. 
Debt is slavery. Stay out of it. And I don't want to hear excuses about it. I'll get to the excuses later. All right? I'm going to destroy all your excuses for it. Okay? But now let's talk a little bit about... Somebody's asking what good debt is. Did you not just watch the last slide, Annabelle? It was up for about seven minutes. It was up for about seven minutes. Come on, guys. Stay with me. All right? Okay. Now, cash flow versus bad debt. Cash flow. Why am I bringing this up? This has been a really popular term in the last 10 years. Cash flow is king. That's one I've been hearing a lot. Cash flow is king. Guys like Grant Cardone and other people. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Okay? Cash flow is crap. And let me explain what I mean. Let me explain. So don't just let me explain before you, you judge. Okay, let me explain. Cash flow mantras. Cash flow is king. Leverage is your friend. Leverage yourself to supercharge your cash flow. Right? That's what people are talking about. You're never going to get really rich. Every rich person leverages themselves. Really? Interesting. Huh. Because the richest people in this country don't. Bill Gates didn't leverage himself. Zuckerberg, Larry Ellison, Sam Walton, right? Now, I'm not saying cash flow is bad. Let me finish. Cash flow is a big mantra these days. No debt mantras. Cash is king. Pay off all your debt ASAP. Grow slow and steady. Balance your wants versus needs. Basically, guys, for those of you out there that actually have some financial literacy, so to speak, it's Dave Ramsey versus the world for those of you who watch Dave Ramsey. So who's right? The no debt people or the cash flow people? Now, let me ask you a quick question. Right now, with COVID-19, which one of these would you rather be in? Having no debt or cash flow? The people that had, as in past tense, cash flow, they don't have it anymore. Let's talk about it. The simple answer is no debt is the better is the better route. It's a lot safer. Now, is it a lot slower? Absolutely, it's a lot slower, but it's a lot safer, okay? Now, remember, I'm speaking in generalities here. I'm speaking to everybody. There is a small, like less than 10%, and no, you're not it, because everybody thinks they're the 10%. You're not it. There's a small segment of people that are actually responsible enough to have reasonable debt and deal with it properly. The vast majority of people cannot be trusted with debt. It's just like the vast majority of you can't be trusted with following your trading plan. Why can't you be trusted? You can't be trusted simply because you don't have a boss overseeing you. When the cat's away, the mice will play, right? That's what you hear all the time. It's true. A little bit of, a little bit of debt, a little bit of leverage, boom. So there's nothing wrong with cash flow. But going wildly into debt to get cash flow is the problem. And this is what's being taught out there. Going massively, even though they don't they say don't do it, but then their their sales pitches go into debt. They say, oh no, don't take on too much debt. And then their sales pitch goes into huge debt. Ask Grant how that's going right now. Oh, I have a billion dollars in properties. Uh-huh. You don't own shit. You're leveraged to the hilt. You may be at 20% down on those properties and you don't own anything because they're leveraged, because you're all about cash flow. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And when something happens to take away your cash flow, what are you stuck with? A mountain of debt that you can't pay for. A mountain of debt you can't pay for. The bank owns you. You don't own you. No debt. You own you. You own your life. You own your lifestyle. You flip your finger to the world and say, F you. I don't need you because I didn't borrow anything from you. The bank's going to come knocking, right? So when you have no debt, you don't need much cash flow. When you leverage everything, you need lots of cash flow all of the time. So what happens when cash flow dries up? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. No, that never happens, Jared. Never that's a once in a lifetime scenario, dude. Come on. That's like that 50 year hurricane. Really? Huh? Because it's happened twice in 12 years. Really? It's a, it's a once in a lifetime event, but twice in 12 years. That's really strange. Financial crisis of 08. Anybody remember that? 
COVID-19, oh, we're in the middle of it. Anybody remember that? Yeah, you're right. It never happens. That never happens. I know a gentleman in Palm Springs. He owns $3 million in industrial or commercial real estate strip malls. This is back 12 years ago. Okay, why? Because he tried to get me to buy it. But anyway, all right, he owns strip malls. When the financial crisis hit, his revenue dropped by 60%. And he said, I'm barely even breaking even. If it gets any worse, I'm going to have to file bankruptcy. Over leveraged. Three million in property sounds great, but not if you have two and a half million dollars in mortgages on them and the rent just covers it plus some when it's at 80%, 90% capacity. So when it's not at 80 or 90% capacity, it drops to 40% capacity, then what? You're screwed. But hey, you're growing fast. You're growing fast till somebody slaps you silly. Everybody's got a plan till you get punched in the mouth. Financial crisis, COVID, punched in the mouth. I'm not saying cash flow is bad. And I'm not even saying leverage is bad. It's bad when you over leverage, okay? And guys, with cash in general, you always get better pricing by paying in cash, unless you're at a car dealership. So never tell them you're gonna pay in cash at a car dealership till the very end, but that's a different topic, all right? You can buy more with leverage, but you can also lose it a lot quicker. Do you wanna lose your life savings you spent 20, 30 years because you over leveraged yourself? You bought a McMansion that you can't really afford? You bought a rental property that you can't really afford. I'm not suggesting don't buy rentals. I'm not suggesting don't use leverage. I'm suggesting most people, though, are not in a position to safely use it because they're not responsible enough to do so. Okay? So don't think you're immune to it twice in the last 12 years. Okay. Savings. But Jared, you don't understand. I only make $42,000 a year. You don't understand. We'll get there. We'll get there. Savings is a choice, guys, okay? Savings is a choice, all right? Most of you don't think so, but it really is. It's a lifestyle choice. It goes back to those wants and needs. I'm not suggesting that everybody's equal, right? I'm not suggesting that everybody makes a ton of money. I'm not saying that. Savings is still a choice, okay? So let's take a quick look. I'm not gonna spend too much more uh, on this because I still have like, 13 more slides to get through, and we're going kind of long. $200 a month invested at 9%, all right? $220,000 over 25 years. Now, why is this important? You're going, that's not much money. You're right. It's not a terrible amount of money. But what does the average 60-year-old have saved again? Does anybody remember? I'll refresh your memory. $172,000. They have $172,000 in their 60s, okay? By saving $200 a month, for 25 years. So if you started at 40 even, you'd have $220,000, okay? We're out of BYND guys at 89.50. Another stock that just missed target. TTD missed it a little bit earlier. I mean, we made money on it uh, and BYND just missed it by 10 cents. Annoying because TTD was 15 cents and BYND was, but we still made money on both. Um, anyway, $200 a month over 40 years is 875,000. Now, why am I commenting? Because if you're young in your 20s, it doesn't take that much money. Most kids in their 20s can save $200 a month. Why? They don't have a wife. They don't have kids. They don't have a husband, kids, whatever. Um, and they're spending that $200 at Starbucks going out with their friends or on car payments or things they shouldn't be doing. Most young people can save $200 a month. Most. So don't give me this crap. It's actually harder to save it in your 40s with a family than it is in your 20s with nobody, even though you're making less. So this is almost becoming a millionaire, almost becoming a millionaire. And that's assuming a static $200. You would hope you invest a little more as you make a little more. You would hope so. So what's the excuses? Here's $500 a month. Now, why did I choose five? Because that's what the average car payment is in America. If you can afford a car payment, you can certainly afford to invest $500. If you're finding a way to pay your car payment, you could probably find a way to put $500 in your savings account, okay? Half a million dollars in 25 years. $2.1 million if you start young. Now, for somebody who's 25, 500 a month is doable, but it might be a challenge. I'll agree with that. It might be a challenge. It might take some sacrifice. But again, this is what people are averaging in this country. 
172,000 at retirement. It's pathetic. Okay. One second. Now we go to $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month. A millionaire in 25 years. You'll be worth $4 million if you do it for 40 years. Guys, let me ask you a question. I'm serious for a second. Don't bullshit with me. It's rhetorical, so I'm just talking to myself. You don't think you can make $1,000 a month on a side hustle? You don't think you could be a bartender and make $1,000 a month? One night a week, two nights a week? You don't understand, Jared. I'm just so exhausted after my 40-hour work week. I just, there's no way I could do that. I'm just so tired after sitting in the office and typing into that Excel spreadsheet all day. It's just ravishingly, painfully tiring. There's no way I could possibly drive an Uber or Lyft. God forbid my friends saw me working at night shift at Walmart or being a bartender or a busboy or a waiter. Why am I mentioning those jobs? Because anybody can get those jobs. You don't need a college degree for those jobs. You couldn't make an extra thousand dollars or even five hundred dollars a month you don't you just don't get it jared you don't get it i'm i worked 43 hours last week i'm really tired and besides you know like my wife gets angry sometimes if i'm not there exactly at 5 30 or 6 o'clock for dinner sacrifice stop blaming rich people for stealing your money when the money's there for you too the only difference is they worked harder for it by the way because i'm going to quell this problem right now <clears throat> Statistically speaking, only 23% of Americans retire off an inheritance. 23%. That means 77% of people that are millionaires and are wealthy had zero inheritance. 77%. 77%. So don't tell me, oh, he's just a trust fund baby, or she's got a rich mommy or daddy. 77% don't that become millionaires. Now what? Don't make excuses, okay? Now, 50 bucks. Why am I bringing 50 bucks into the mix? Because the average 60 year old only has $172,000. And you can't tell me you can't find 50 bucks a month. Everybody can. Even if you're making 30 grand a year and you have a wife and two kids, where are you gonna find it? Bartender, busboy, waiter, Dig ditches for people, cut people's lawns, drive Uber. You can't find 50 stinking dollars? Get out of here. Then you don't, you're just gonna retire poor. Takes discipline. Nobody said that it doesn't take discipline. You just stop making excuses. All right? Stop making excuses. Okay? And remember, debt afflicts everybody. Okay? Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your race or your creed, afflicts everybody. The average person. Retires with nothing. It's not nothing, but it's not very much money at 170 grand, 117 grand, okay? So stop making excuses. Now, this is the area where we're gonna try a little bit, because again, this is basically 20 or 30 slides out of a 200 page course that I haven't even put out there yet. It's not even finished yet, okay? Now we're gonna talk a little bit about thinking about your future. We talked about the problems, the things that people do wrong. Now I want to talk about some considerations, how you can get out of that rut, how you can retire with more than you have. But I'm not going to go crazy deep into this. All right. That's the trade off today. So, for example, these are things we would consider inflation, life expectancy, taxation, interest rates, appreciation, draw or distribution levels into retirement, investment decisions, all of this. All right, so these will be individual chapters in the course. All right, you see all these? There'll be this plus about seven more chapters. These are all individual, yes, a whole chapter on inflation. Can you imagine that? An entire chapter on taxation. I know, crazy, but that's what it's gonna be. We just don't have time for it today. But I do wanna get through a few more slides, okay? So, stocks over the past 20 years, 7.8% return up until December 18, all right? Bonds, 5.5%. Cash, 1.8%. So guys, here's the rub. In bad markets, the impulse is to leave the market and, quote, stay safe. But cash has only outperformed the market twice in the past 20 years. 
Do you guys remember? You guys remember this? Remember we talked about this last week and the week before? People up here getting in too late or not at all. We're going to revisit this in a couple of minutes. Not this second, but we're going to revisit this because you're going to see how sad it is for people out there because they're not invested in the markets. Many people, a lot of people are not invested in the markets. Okay, so let's take a look here. Investing in something, guys, is almost always better than cash. Right? I know when you're younger, maybe Great Depression folks, oh, put your cash in them under the mattress. It's just not statistically true. It's true here or there once every decade, one year out of 10, it's true. What do you do for the other nine? You cash, you're going backwards. It's that simple. You go backwards when you have cash, okay? So time frame is important as well, guys. So here is small stocks, large stocks, bonds, T-bills. T-bills are as close to cash as you're going to get with any kind of return. This is from 1926 to 2017. So this is a couple of few years old. But small stocks, large stocks, average of the amount, you're in the 11% range. $1 invested over this period of 90 years, I know it's a long time, is $36,000. That's small caps. $1 invested in large caps is $7,000. Look at government bonds. $143, guys. Do you think there's any difference there between $143 and $36,000? $1 in treasury bills is worth $21 today. Guys, 90-year investment and your $1 is worth 20. Now, some people say, well, that's a 20-fold 20, 20 increase, 21-fold increase. I think I'd rather have this, the 36,000% increase. What is this telling you? Why aren't you in the market? But time frame does matter. This is over 90 years because you're going to see on the next couple slides, things change depending on your timeline. This is gold versus stocks over the last 40 years. Stocks are up 3,000%. Gold is up 500-ish. Now, granted, this is old. This goes back about six years, something like that. So gold could be higher, but that's not the point of the chart. Over the long term, Stocks grossly outperform gold, but that's long 30, 40, 50 years. What you're going to find interesting is in shorter periods, commodities do better than you think. So over the last 20 years, gold is the second best performing asset class out there. Now we could talk about art, we could talk about collectible cars, but I'm not going to do that. That's a niche market, okay? Gold is the second best performing asset class in the last 20 years. So are real estate investment trusts. Interesting. But the, what I want you to take from this is cash is lower than inflation and the average investor is lower than cash. Think about what I just said because this is that's the aha moment. Cash makes less money than inflation, which means you're losing money and the average person makes the exact same amount. The average investor makes the same amount as cash. Very interesting, isn't it? The average investor makes the same amount as cash. The re same return as cash. So any other investment asset class did better than the average investor. And you guys are worried about making a mistake investing. Very fascinating, isn't it? Okay. Guys, in case you're curious, because I'm going to get a question about it, this EAFE, guys, this is Europe, Australia, Asian, Far East, etc. Okay. It's basically foreign markets. Okay. To just put a, a, a generalization stamp on it. All right. Investing in REITs, gold, stock market, far better than leaving your money under the mattress. Okay. And granted, this is over a 20-year period. Over a 40 or 50 or historic period, stocks are number one. Okay? Real estate investment trust versus stocks. This is a 10-year return from 09 to 17. 468% versus 260 for stocks. Now, there's a method to my madness. Trust me. In one slide, you're like, geez, Jared, stocks are the best. In the next slide... You tell me real estate investment trusts are the best. In the next slide, you show oil is really great. What gives, dude? 
What's your problem, man? There's two takeaways from this, okay? One, investing in anything is better than investing in cash. That's number one takeaway. Investing in just about anything is better than investing in cash. So that's number one, okay? And number two, it really depends on your timeline, how you need to invest. So if you have 10 years before retirement, I probably wouldn't do 100% stocks. But if I'm 22 years old and I'm not retiring for 40 years, I'm going to be like 99% stocks because it's the best performing asset class over the long run, almost always, almost always, okay? If you're in your 40s, maybe a more diversified portfolio is better for you. But that's an individual depending on your risk tolerance, your timeline. Guys, it actually matters how much money you have. See, wealthy people can afford to be more aggressive with certain investments because they don't need to live off that percentage of their wealth. You got $100 million and you can allocate $10 million to an aggressive investment. You're not going to you're not going to eat ramen noodles if you lose that $10 million. But if you only have $100,000, you can't be as aggressive. Right? So, number 1, wake up, stop investing in cash, stop pulling your money out of the market and get back in the market because sadly the average investor is pathetic. Let me show you. The average American or the percentage of Americans invested in the market is declining. As the market goes up, the number of people invested in the market goes down. This is sad. How are you going to get wealthy if you're not invested in something that actually gives you reasonable returns? You've got to make at least 3% to beat inflation. Cash is not king when it comes to retirement and long-term investing, okay? You know what's another sad stat? Personal savings rate in this country. 1970, it was near 12%. Now it's 3. 3%. let think about this for a second. 2009 until three months ago. 10 and a half years, we had the longest bull run in the history of the market. One of the best economies we've seen for that entire time. Unemployment at the lowest rates in recorded history. Even wage growth before you jump on, oh, Jared, wages. No, wages were not stagnant. Wage growth increased. Inflation was insanely low. And Americans saved less during that time than they did before. They saved less during the greatest, or I should say longest bull run, economy, market, all that put together, and they're saving less. That just doesn't make sense. It's because we're a consumer society. You gotta have the newest, how many of you, you don't have to answer, it's rhetorical. How many of you get a new iPhone every zero to two years. You don't have to answer. Zero to two years, you get a new iPhone. Probably a lot of you. Probably a lot of you. Why? They're $1,000, they're 1200 bucks. Your savings rate's going down because you're at the drive-through at Starbucks three times a week. You're sending your kids on trips you can't afford, racking up 17% interest rate on credit cards. What are you doing? Right? What are you doing? Real quick, and then I'm going to I'm going to end this with a couple slides. The best performing stock of the past 10 years, believe it or not, is Netflix. Okay? There's a method to buy and this again. Netflix. 3680% as of December of 2019. 3680% Okay, think about that for a second. 3,680%, that's a hell of a return, isn't it? The best performing commodity was palladium, 354% as of December, 2019. Okay, what's my point? My point is you're not gonna get those. It's unlikely the only investment you made in the last 10 years was Netflix. Maybe there's a couple people. 
It's unlikely the only commodity you bought in the last 10 years is palladium. Okay? My point is, is forget about this. Stop reading Motley Fool has put out their, their top buy the only time they've done so in the last 97 years. All right? And then the last 14 top buys, wait, one every 97 years? That doesn't make sense. Oh, you can't miss this investment. Oh my gosh, you're going to retire in 12 months. Oh, you're going to take $12. No, let me, what was it? 486 or $512 into a million. Come watch me do my million dollar stock challenge. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. That and Motley Fool, right? American Ninja Motley Fool, all right? And you have this unrealistic perception of reality. What you, what you think is reality is not reality. The point I'm making is simple. Don't worry about getting the best performing stock. Don't worry about the best performing commodity. Don't worry you didn't buy Bitcoin 10 years ago and you could have made 28 million percent on it, 295 million percent, whatever it is. You're not likely going to pick the best stock or the best commodity in the next 20 years. But you don't have to. That's the brilliance of it. You don't have to. It's better than cash, though. VT Sachs, Total Market Fund, the SPY ETF, the Q's. There's a ton of mutual funds that mirror the market. They're going to be better than cash, and they're not going to be as good as Netflix. So what? All you need to do is start investing whether it's REITs, whether it's oil. I don't know about oil these days, but that's besides the point. Okay, whether it's the stock market. The easiest thing to do is buy a total market fund and sit back and put money in every single month. Because this is pathetic. Like, this is really sad that the market's gone up in the last 10 years and 7 or 8 fewer percentage, 7 or 8% fewer people are invested in the market during this long run. The average investor over the last 20 years has made 1.9%. 1.9% and the market's at like 8 to 10%. Okay? Now, how do you get wealthier? Five minutes, we're ending this. You manage and control debt. You pay off credit cards, no car loans, smaller mortgage. You manage and control your debt. I don't want to hear the word, I needed it. No, you didn't. 99% chance you didn't need it. I don't care if you have to eat pasta one night, rice the next night, ramen noodles the other night, and whatever, and then have leftovers the next three nights. Until you get out of debt, you're going to sacrifice. When you get out of debt, you can take some of the money you use to pay off debt and start investing in things and maybe take a little for yourself. Prioritize your savings. Balance your needs versus your wants. You have to prioritize your savings, okay? It has to come first. Whatever your salary is, just take 20% off and act like you don't have it. I understand for people making 20, 30, 40 grand a year, this is not an easy thing to do. But we already talked about skipping investments and going right to increasing your earnings. Try to get a promotion at work. Work more hours. Get a side job. This is how you do these things, guys. It's not rocket science. It just takes discipline, which most of you don't have. I'll repeat it. Most of you just don't have it because you see something on TV and you need that new hat that Tom Brady wore. Ooh, right? Got to have those new Air Jordans. Got to have those. The last dance. I want to be like Mike. F being like Mike. Mike's got money. Why does he have money? Because a bunch of you broke-ass people bought his sneakers. And you couldn't afford them when you bought them. You know you couldn't. $200 for Air Jordans. Go ahead. If you're making plenty of money and you have no debt, you bought it on credit. So they weren't $200. They were $200 plus the 17% that you paid probably on the minimums over like an eight-year. You ever look at a credit card statement, guys? If you pay the minimum, it's like 23-year payoff. How nuts that is? The process is so simple. It's not easy. It's simple. Manage and control your debt. Stop telling yourself you need it. You need it. No, you want it and you don't need it. So don't buy it. Okay. Prioritize savings. Savings has to be close to the top of your list of things to do every month. It's up there with eating because if you don't save, you don't retire. And if you've ever had a, like a carpentry job in the union or an electrician job or a plumber, 
They make good money, by the way, but if you've ever had one of those jobs, your body is destroyed by the time you're 50. Your knees are shot, your back shot. I know, I have family members that have done it. Uncles that's a union plumber, uncle that's a union electrician, and uncle that's a union carpenter. That's how I know. They're like 60 and they look like they're in a wheelchair. They look like they're 90 because of swinging a hammer their whole life. Anyway, increase your earnings either through a promotion at work, through working more hours if you're able to, or getting a side job, whether that's bartending, working at Walmart, working at a convenience store, whether it's doing Uber, whether it's being a waiter or waitress, whatever. It's possible. I don't want to hear it. Now, I understand, go, geez, Jared, this is the wrong time to say that. Look at the coronavirus. There's a lot. I mean, Amazon's hiring. Walmart's hiring. There's plenty of jobs. You just don't want those jobs. Well, you don't want retirement then either. It's that simple. You don't want retirement then. My pride, my ego. Well, F your ego. If you can't afford it, can't do it. And in summary, retiring poor is a choice. It's not the government's fault. It's not the president's fault. It's not your boss's fault. It's not the union's fault. It's not the rich man's fault. It's your fault. Period. Done. Sure, there might there be one or two percent of people out there that are the exception to the rule and have had some really like truly bad shit happen to them. Yes, you're not likely that person. You think you're that person, but you're probably not that person. Okay. It's your fault that you're in this position. You know what's beautiful about the, the fact that it's your fault? You can get out of it. See, if you can't accept that it's your fault, how are you going to fix the problem if you can't even ex- take blame for the problem? Think about what I just said there. Internalize it for a second. If you're blaming everybody else for your lot in life, you'll never be able to fix your life because it's everybody else's fault but yours. Accept responsibility for where you're at. We've all made bad decisions in life. I've made bad decisions in life, financially and otherwise. You have too. We've all done it. So what? Pull your bootstraps up and say, all right, I messed up. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to learn from it. There's nothing else. You don't have a choice. What else are you going to do? Stay poor forever? All right, if you're that lazy, that's up to you. Stop blaming other people, all right? And just to end on one thing, okay? Just to end on one, yeah. And there's no victim mentality because it never succeeds. I'm going to end on this. You've all seen the story. You've all heard the story. Well, geez, Jared, that's unusual. Well, I'm just putting it out there because it proves one thing. It can be done. You ready? You've seen it before. Here it is. It proves it can be done. A janitor secretly amassed an $8 million fortune and left most of it to his library and hospital. A janitor. How much do you think janitors make? I saw the picture of the guy. It didn't look like he was a janitor in San Francisco, you know, for a rich billionaire. It certainly didn't look that way. $8 million. Not $1 million. Not 300000 Not $2 million, Not seven, eight million dollars. I'm going to guess that many of you out there listening make more than a janitor makes. Because I can't imagine they make much more than 40 grand a year, maybe 50 on the high side. Now there might, we're not talking about trash truck drivers and those. Those guys make pretty good money. I'm talking about a janitor, school janitor, those types of things, hospital janitor, etc. They don't make that much money. Eight million dollars. I don't want to hear your excuses. Just don't want to hear it. I got a wife. I have two kids. Get a side hustle. If you're too lazy to do it, then stop complaining. That's all. All right. So guys, this was just a snippet from a lecture slash course that I'll be teaching probably in three months. I'm not done it. I want to polish it up and make sure it's great. Um, Two, 250 pages, something like that. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I understand that it's not directly related to trading. But I'm hoping it opened your eyes about the sad state that most people are in and unfortunately not doing much about. All right. And I, one last thing, too. It's just not taught anywhere. And I don't know why. I mean, I, I have it under. I, I can guess why they want it. They want to keep you dependent. Take control of your life, man. Take control. You can do VS Max if you want. VT Sachs. I like VT Sachs personally, but it's up to you. Um, so. That'll do it for this week's lecture. I know it wasn't specifically trading related, but I got a lot of requests for it. So I did it. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm Jared Wesley. We'll get back at it again next week. To get more great educational content, subscribe 
to the Live Traders YouTube channel. This way you'll get email alerts every time I upload a new video.